testing one two testing one two testing testing one two testing testing one 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 Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, testing.
for this acoustic testing No filter test, no filters on the audio test.
test testing one two three One, two, three, test one, two, three. Testing. Testing. Testing one, two, three, test. Testing one, two, three. Test. Testing one, two, three. Test one, two. Test one, two. Testing one, two, three. Test one, two. Testing one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Testing one two three. Test one two. Test one two three. Testing one two three. In the ring tomorrow. Test, testing one two three. So today's lecture will be on. Here's a ring book. What's that? You have a ring. What? I have a ring as well. Test one two. There's a ring on this. Oh, you have a ring. Yeah. Test one two. Testing one two. Test one two three. Test 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 one two. Test one two three. So the show starts at six p.m. Six p.m. Test one two. Test one two. Test one two three. Test one two. This is the middle of it. Test one two three. Test one two. Test one two. Test one two three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Test test one, two. Test one, two. Test test testing one, two, three. You get a little bit closer to your test. You can push it up here. Just. Are you going to try? Testing one, two, three. Test. Test. Testing one, two, three. The volume's not up yet. Lungs over. Testing one, two, three. Test. Testing one, two, three. Put the volume up over there. Test one, two, three. How does it sound? Testing one, two, three. Does it sound good? Today's event starts at 6 p.m. Hope to see everybody here. Wait. Testing one, two, three. Okay, now we need to figure out how to get, like, there's a little ring to it. Testing one, two, three. Shoot. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a little ring to this one. I'm trying to minimize the output, the red one, and so I can maximize the little other ones to it. That's what I was doing on the other events, is just minimizing that. Testing one, two, three. Hello? Okay, so let's just read this kind of. Can we just have a talk? Yeah. What do you want to read this? Uh, what do you want to for lunch? I'm going to read a paragraph. All permissions granted by me and all releases by me herein shall be effective in perpetuity yeah. and throughout the universe. All permissions and releases here and extend and apply to the Mechanics Institute. Hey. <laughs> and we're live on Facebook Live. Let's hold an IT discussion. Um so what are you doing for spring break? <laughs> <laughs> This is this is live. <laughs> Just letting you know that right now. Um, no, today's event starts at six p.m. Um, and it's about. I'll let you. I'll let Matt tell you what it's about. Sure. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it's explaining the East-West culture gap, um, and we're gonna have a guest speaker. Two guest speakers. We're gonna have Geese Jen and Maxine Hong Kingston. And uh, this is free for all Mechanics Institute members, and it's only $15 for the general public. It starts at 6 o'clock at 
Mechanics Institute Library Meeting Room. So if you're free, come swing by the Mechanics Institute fourth floor. And if you're not free, you can still watch us on Facebook Live. Yeah, follow Mechanics Institute. Follow Mechanics Institute, and you'll be um, you'll have notifications on whenever we have a live feed. Perfect. Perfect. I think we're good to go. Yeah, everything sounds really good. Let's go get some um, lunch. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go get some lunch. All right, we'll see you guys back at six o'clock. You guys. Nice.
Testing one two test testing one two test testing 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 one two test test testing testing one two test testing testing one two testing one two test testing testing one two
two, testing one, two, test, testing one, two. Testing, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Hello, this is Roy. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is it an audio test? Testing one, two, three. Perfect.
There's something so that we know that's oh. uh, level of milk. Oh, hi. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Test, testing one, two. It's good right here. It's just the lighting that makes it. Well, we don't so want fun. her to block the speakers and we don't want her to block the banner. So the rope is still right now. It should, should yeah, be right still right here. Yeah. Okay. What rope is?
Testing one, two.
Now it's on. Yes, this is oh, I'm fine. Thank you. The fate of immigration. Okay. So good evening, 
and thank you for joining us here at Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street in San Francisco. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our program on March 8th, 2017, International Women's Day. And we are honored to have two great women of arts and letters to celebrate. Author Gish Jen in conversation with writer-poet Maxine Hong Kingston. Tonight we celebrate the personal and public pride and achievements of women around the world. And also Gish's new book, The Girl at the Baggage Claim, Explaining the East-West Culture Gap, which explores how heritage, culture, and country shape our identity, values, and behavior. Now, for those of you who are new to the Mechanics Institute, we'd like to invite you to come on Wednesday at noon to have a free tour of our library and our beautiful Beaux-Arts building. Also, please consider becoming a member and attend most of our programs for free. The Mechanics Institute continues to be one of the most vital cultural and literary centers in the Bay Area, with ongoing author events, panels, Cinema Lit Film Series on Friday night, book clubs, computer classes, writers groups, and chess classes and tournaments throughout the calendar year, seven days a week. So pick up our calendar, see us at milibrary.org, and become part of our ever-growing cultural family. Also, after our program, program, we invite you to join us down at the Dada Bar in our retail spaces below for a, you know, for a refreshment. And members do get a 10% discount at the Dada Bar and Gallery. And now I'd like to introduce our special guests. Gish Jen is the author of four novels and a book of stories including The Love Wife, Mona in the Promised Land, Typical America, Who's Irish, and World and Town. Gish's new work is an extension of her nonfiction book, Tiger Writing, from the Harvard Massey Lectures, and a rumination on the East-West culture gap, drawing on social science and her own experiences. Her honors include Lannan Literary Award for Fiction and the Mildred and Harold Strauss Living Award from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She teaches from time to time in China and lives with her family in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Maxine Hong Kingston's first book, The Woman Warrior, China Men, was published in 1976 and won the National Book Circle Award. Her second book, China Men, earned the National Book Award. Kingston has also won the Penn West Award for Fiction for Trip Master Monkey and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature. In 2014, she was awarded the National Humanities Medal of Arts, presented at the White House by President Obama. Her most recent book is a memoir in verse, I Love a Broad Margin to My Life. Kingston is currently the Senior Lecturer Emerita at the University of California in Berkeley. And this is the 40th anniversary of the Women Warrior Chinamen, which will be out in a new edition this spring. So we are pleased to welcome our East Coaster, Gish Jen, and our West Coast gal, Maxine Hong Kingston, <laughs> to Mechanics Institute. <laughs> I like that. It gives a whole different meaning to East-West, right? <laughs> and there is a cultural gap. Um, anyway, I, am, I did just publish. Um, oh, you want me to stand on here? Okay. Oh, the, the, the camera. Oh, oh, off camera. Oh, goodness. Okay, should I stand right here? Um, or sit. All right, I will happily sit. Um, you know, my book was just published um, last week, and um, I gave my first reading at um, Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, you know, right there in the front row was an old friend of mine. 
And I looked at her, and as soon as I looked at her, I remembered sitting on her lawn with her 30 years ago. And um, back then, we were um, in heavy discussion about how some writers wrote too many books. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean you. I don't mean you. No, not me. But anyway, back then, we decided that the perfect number of books was seven. And, um, and, um, and I, you know, at the time, I had just started Typical American. The whole idea that I was going to write one real book much less two or three. You know, it seemed really beyond my wildest imaginings. Um, but this is my seventh book. And, um, and, you know, I have to say that, you know, every single one of these books, you know, I, I, you know, I am always aware that you can write too much. And, you know, and every one of these books, you know, I don't sit down until I have this feeling that, you know, I absolutely must write this book. You know, it's a very, you know, it's something where, you know, where I feel like I would rise off my deathbed to finish it, right? And until you have that feeling, um, I feel like you shouldn't sit down. Um, in fact, I often tell my, uh, my students, you know, I don't know how many of you remember the rhyme of the ancient mariner, you know, and, and, you know, and there's the crazy guy and he's grabbing people by their lapels and he's like, listen to me, you know? But I think until you have that feeling like, listen to me, you know, you really shouldn't be starting your book at all, right? Um, in any case, um, so I have written this book. Um, in many ways, it's my riskiest book. Um, I will say it's very definitely my um, my uh, most useful book. Um, and if you ask me, you know, so why did I write it? You know, I mean, it is nonfiction, but I wrote it for many of the same reasons that I write my fiction. Um, and that's to say, you know, it is on, on one level a deeply um, personal. Um, a friend of mine once said that you know writing is like listening to a very soft voice. And, and I think that's true. Um, you know, and, you know, in general, one has to be very quiet in order to hear that very soft voice. Um, but it is true that every now and then the voice just kind of pops out. And, um, that happened to me, um, 25 years ago when my son was born. And, um, I was in a mother's group and, um, our kids were like four weeks old and we were going around the circle. The first thing is that you know, everybody else, the other mothers had all put their babies on the floor, like right there on the hard floor. And I could not do that. So, you know, <laughs> we're going around the uncircle. Everybody else has their baby on the floor. I'm holding my baby like this. Um, and then we go around and, and um, we're each supposed to say, you know, what it was that we most hoped for for our baby. And everybody else said that they want, they hoped that their baby would be independent. I mean, you know, these children were breastfeeding. <laughs> they couldn't hold their heads up yet. I was just like, independent? I mean, this had never crossed my mind. And I just said, you know, I, I wanted my baby to be happy, you know? Um, but, you know, that was one of the first times and I realized that even though, you know, I am the child of immigrants, and um, you know, even though I kind of look like everybody else, and, you know, I was doing just fine in American society, obviously, but that there was something about me actually that was a little bit different. You know, it was my, this was my, my first glimpse into this fact. Um, and, um, you know, since then I've had m many, many, many more moments like that. And, you know, I should tell you that, you know, this is not because I was, you know, in any way the stereotypical Asian. I was like quite the contrary. I mean, I was a rebel from the get-go. So I did everything wrong. Um, and I, and I, and I do mean everything, including becoming a novelist. Uh, which, by the way, by the, by the time I did it, you know, only one person in America had, had successfully done it, you know, who looked like me. That was her. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this was this was definitely not the career path of choice. Let me just say. Um, so, you know, I was not in any way, you know, you would never look at me and say, like, oh, of course she feels different than everybody else. You know, you would never have said that. Um, but like I say, there were many, many moments um, that followed that um, where I became, I became um, aware of the fact that actually there was something about me that was a little bit different than the mainstream. Um, and not only about me, but also about my family. Um, you know, to this day, um, my mother is 91. And, you know, I have three brothers. And, you know, she, my brothers have lunch with her every day. You know, sometimes two of them go, sometimes all three of them are there, like every day, you know. Um, and my brother, I will say also, um, goes to see my father's grave, like, very often. And he sits there, he tells my father, gives him the report on everything. Um, you know, it's clear to me that, you know, all these years later, that, you know, my, my father is still my brother's um, most important audience, 
you know, and um, and that this is, I realize, is, is not like everybody. Um, now, all this said, you know, I didn't actually only write this book for myself. Um, I also wrote it because, you know, I have been going um, to China since 1979. Um, I have taught in China any number of times in any number of places. So I have taught in Shandong, I've taught in Beijing, I've taught in Hong Kong. Um, I was just teaching in Shanghai just this last fall semester. Um, and, you know, of course, China has changed enormously. Um, but it is clear to me that there is still quite a cultural gap. Um, and um, such is the gap that really, you know, you, actually with globalization, you don't even have to go to China to, um, to and, you know, encounter this gap anymore. It's right here in many of our classrooms. I think um, pretty much every um, Western educator I know of who has, you know, um, students from China in their classroom has a story, right? Um, a story rather like um, the girl in the baggage claim. Um, um, the girl in the baggage claim um, it, that, that that story is a real story. Um, what happened was that there was a girl um, who who applied um, for admission to Milton Academy, which is outside of Boston, very prestigious um, independent school. Um, she was applying from Asia. She had great TOEFL scores. She wrote a great essay. She had great, you know, everything, right? Great Skype interview. Um, Milton was very excited. They went to the airport to go get her. And right Pretty much as soon as she arrived, people realized this person is not quite what I'd expect, what we'd expected. And um, as the semester went on, um, it became in increasingly clear that something was really quite different. And um, by the end of the semester, it was clear that the person who had come um, was not the girl in the Skype interview, but her sister. <laughs> okay. um, and, and this, and this, this, this shocked the head of school, it shocked other heads of school. In fact, I first heard the story from another head of school. Um, but I tell you, listen to the story, I was not shocked, you know. Um, I mean, of course, it was wrong. You know, it was wrong, it's fraud, it, there's no way that, you know, there's nothing that you, you, there's no way that you can dress this up. I mean, it was wrong. Um, but what, but the idea of substituting one person for another, <laughs> you're already laughing, you know, is, is very Asian, you know? I mean, you know, this is, this is really not that unusual thing. In fact, um, my uh, Chinese tutor, um, last, last uh, semester when I was in Shanghai, um, you know, she told me that, you know, she had a best friend. Her best friend, um, was not very athletic. Um, their school had a, a physical fitness requirement. Um, and so when it time to, came time to go do the long jump, she, she, my tutor, went and did the long jump for her friend. Um, of course, she did so well that her friend was then recruited for, for track and field. <laughs> but, you know, this is the kind of thing, I can't even tell you, this kind of thing happens all the time. You know, I myself, um, I, um, I gave a reading with Sutong, you know, kind of did event very much like this. I did a little Sutong, um, as many of you may know, as the, as the um, author of um, Raise the Red Lantern, many other wonderful books. And, uh, you know, at the end of the thing, everyone was very excited, and people just really wanted me to sign something. But we were at a Chinese language bookstore. I didn't have any books. Um, so they said, well, would you just write, you know, would you just sign Sutong's book? <laughs> I said, this would be like as if I, oh, Maxine, I'll sign your book. <laughs> I'll you sign know, yours. And, and I look at Sutong's, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. You know, so, you know, I happily signed Sutong's book. Um, I mean, I did sign my own name, but it was clear to me that I could have signed his name and everyone would still have been happy. <laughs> uh, but I, ca I can't tell you how, how common this kind of thing is in China, actually. Um, and for those of you who know things like the story of the stone, you know, the dream of the red chamber, if you'd ever seen the manuscript, you would say, you know, he had, um, Cao Shui Qin had, you know, had people, other people who were kind of helping him. His collaborators have written all over the manuscript. You know, this is not like notes in the margin, you know, it's not like a little comment box over here. No, no, no. It is, they have written all over the manuscript. Um, and those of you who, you know, who know what a, you know, what traditional Chinese painting looks like also will know that, you know, you can have the painting and friends will write things on the, you know, <laughs> around the painting and people who own the painting will also write on the painting, you know. Um, you know, the idea that, that, that this, that this piece of art is like a, is like a precious thing that should not be touched and that be kind of solitary is totally absent. And, 
you know, I think that when we think about these things, you know, it's really no surprise that we have problems with, you know, intellectual property laws and so on. Um, but if we really ask ourselves, you know, why is it that we have so many issues around um, originality? You know, every single matter that has to do with originality. Uh, why do we have so many issues um, between the East and the West? Um, the answer is that the underlying self is different. Now, um, I know that you know maybe people will say that China is changing, and of course, you know if you equate you know individualism with um, self-centeredness and uh, collectivism with altruism, then you know you would say, well, Chinese, the young people today are really not, not very collectivistic. I mean, you know, because they're so selfish. You know, especially these kids who've grown up. You know, um, the results of the of the one child policy. I mean, these kids are very, very, very spoiled. All these little emperors, right? They're very self centered. Um, but uh, but I would actually argue that um, you know the way that we think about individualism and collectivism is actually a little bit off, and you know it's, it, that individualism is, is not coincident with self centeredness, um, but something else. Um, and that's why in my book I use these different terms to try to get away from this uh, individualism and collectivism thing. Um, I use the terms um, uh, big pit self and flexi self. Um, and you'll ask, well, what do I mean by that, right? Um, I will say that, you know, before I can say anything about the self, um, you know, that, you know, just as you can be left-handed or right-handed, but you can actually use both hands, you know, so you can be a big pit self or a flexi self, but, you know, we both have both selves in us. Um, and just as some people are really fully ambidextrous, um, there are also, there are people who really have both selves, and I would put myself in that category, um, absolutely. Um, and but what do I really mean? Um, but anyway, and I would say that. And so these cells are on a, on a on a continuum, right? I mean, it, it's not like a black white. You know, it's not like either or, right? Um, but if we looked at the two ends of the continuum, they are quite different. And I would argue one dominates in the east and one dominates in the west. Um, the Western South, um, we're very familiar um, with from all of our ads, you know, the whole um, dominant narrative that we have. You know, it's very much like an avocado, right? It's an avocado. We have a big pit in the middle, <laughs> very big pit. Um, uh, a big pit, a sacred pit, I will say, by the way. It's a big sacred pit. Um, we feel that this is our essence. It is our identity. Um, it is the thing to which we must, above all, be true. Um, when we think about our education, so much of our education is geared toward developing that pit, toward understanding what's unique about that pit, right? Um, the free expression of that pit is very important, so that um, and all the, the products of, of that free expression are also important. That's why we protect them. That's why we have intellectual um, property laws, because they are the expression of our sacred avocado pit. And and um, and and also that's it's also why we we think uh, freedom of um, freedom of speech is so important, right? So this this pit must be free to uh, ex express itself, and you know to us that is a very very important priority. But in the Far East, they don't have this big pit at all, right? They have a flexi self. So it's like if you imagine that you know our ideas about what's really true, you know, it, that it all comes from in here. But you know, in Asia, what's really true is in the culture. It's it's outside of ourselves, right? So you know, if if in the West, you know, our highest cultural ideal is the genius, somebody with a big pit, right? Um, somebody who listens to themselves. You know, in, in Asia, you know, the ideal is the master. Someone who has absorbed, has absorbed the tradition, absorbed the culture, and then added something to it. You know, it's not that you know, it's it's not that the self is not there, whatever that means, but it's it's not that um, that there isn't an active person grappling and choosing, making decisions. But very foundationally, it looks outward first, and and then and then thinks. How can I add to this very great thing? Um, these and this difference of emphasis is is enormous, and um, and we can talk about it some more, you know, in our Q and A and so on. Um, but I will say that I do think that it it underlies an enormous number of issues. You know, we look at you know East West, and you think of all the things that are most baffling um, about the East to the West, and most baffling about the West to the East. Um, underlying many of them is this difference in self. And I will say that we see evidence of it um, in, 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 the, in the literature, not only of Asian writers, but also 
of our great Asian American writers. And um, I was really struck by this passage um, from you, Maxine, um, when you sort of say, you know, whenever I come to a low point in my life or work, when I read Virginia Woolf's Orlando, that always seems to get my life force moving again. That's your chi, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I just love the way she can make one character live for 400 years, or that Orlando can be a man, Orlando can be a woman. Virginia broke through the constraints of time, of gender, of culture. And you also said, um, William Carlos Williams does the same thing. Abraham Lincoln is a mother of our country. He talks about this wonderful woman walking through the battlefields with her beard and shawl. I'm sorry. Abraham Lincoln is a mother of our country. He walks, he talks about this wonderful woman walking through the battlefields with her beard and shawl. I find that so freeing that we don't have to be confined to being just one ethnic group or one gender. Wolf and Williams make me feel that I can now write as a man, I can write as a black person, I can write as a white person. I don't have to be restrained by time or physicality, or I might add, my big pit. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, Gish, when I am um, getting ready to come here, and oh my gosh, I, I'm giving another presentation. I feel uh, stage fright, and I'll just call my sister, and she can come. I'll write the books, and she'll get up here, and she'll talk, and you won't know the difference, and, and she'll be... I mean, she looks like me. She has the same voice. She's read my work. I'm sure she could answer all the questions. <laughs> okay, so this is the 40th anniversary of The Woman Warrior, the book. But it's the 1500th anniversary, or it's been 1500 years since the chant of The Woman Warrior began. Uh, when you uh, write, uh, when you write out the myths in your own words, then you capture the power of those people. And uh, so, I wrote out the uh, story of Famulan in um, uh, in prose, and, and and I wrote it as a feminist, uh, uh, a feminist. Uh, uh, <coughs> A feminist battle story. Um, okay, so then, then 30 years go by, and and I and I become more and more of a pacifist, and I think, well, you know, that war story, maybe I should um, take a look at it again, and and the more I looked at it, um, the more translations I would find, or the more versions I would find uh, from people. You know, the chant being 1500 years old and, uh, being chanted, uh, it changes. So there, there must be like millions of versions. Uh, every time anybody, uh, chants a, uh, a, a poem or a song, it, it's different. And, and the more I, um, uh, try to get closer to the, the original story, the more I saw that I had made a huge mistake by writing it in prose. It should be done in poetry, and it should be done as a chant. And uh, so I, um, I translated the chant, and, um, and I got it closer to the way it, um, it should be. And it, in um, in Chinese, it begins with a sound, chick chick chick, and that is the sound of weaving. It's a sound of um, the uh, shuttle going through the loom. 
But chick also has a meaning. Chick means to weave. Chick means to knit. And chick means to heal. Chick, chick, chick. Chick, chick, chick. Fa Muklan is weaving the shuttle through the loom when news of the draft comes. Each family must provide one man to be a soldier in the army. Sparing her dear father the wretched life of a soldier, she disguises herself as a man and goes in his stead to war. With heavy armor and her hand-fitting sword, she fights wars. Her horse's hooves pound the earth. She cannot hear the voices of home. She is away long years and many battles. So long a time that her father and mother grow old and die. At the head of her army, giving chase and being chased, she suffers wounds. Blood drips red from the openings of her armor. Her army, chasing and being chased, passes her home village six times, back and forth past her home. But she cannot stop to place offerings on the graves. In terrible battle, General Muklan defeats an enemy, and the king proffers rewards. She asks to go home, the war be done. She takes her army to her home village and orders them to wait for her in the square. Indoors, she takes off man's armor and bathes, dresses herself in pretty silks, and reddens her cheeks and lips. She upsweeps her long black hair and adorns it with flowers. Presenting herself to the army, she says, I was the general who led you. Now, go home. By her voice, the men recognize their general, a beautiful woman. You were our general, a woman. Our general was a woman, a beautiful woman. A woman led us through the war. A woman has led us home. Famuklan disbands the army. Return home. Farewell, beholding and becoming yin, the feminine, come home from war. Chick, 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 chick. Now, um, it is not a feminist battle cry. It is not only a feminist battle cry, and it's not just a war chant. It's a come home from war chant. It is also a filial piety chant. This, these are the values that we grew up with. Gish talks about um, this girl who takes this, her sister's place at school. What about a daughter taking her father's place in war? I mean, that is so, um, that is so drastic. And this is the ideal that, uh, that you could even do that for your father. Uh, this is one of the more palatable, uh, uh, poems, uh, or, or ways of talking about this value. There's another one. I, I think Amy Tan puts it in one of her books. The, um, you know, if there, if a famine comes and everybody's hungry, you cut off your arm and, 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 and cook it and, and, and it, that, and your, and your, it's for your parents to eat. Um, so those are, um, so those are the ideals that we're reaching for. Okay, now uh, she wrote this book, the uh, the girl at the baggage claim. So I'm also going to uh, tell you about a a girl and uh, on an airplane. As you listen to this, um, 
thinking about the interdependency of these families and clans. Um, this, this poem is about me, and it's about my mother, and it's also about this girl on the airplane. But see how the identities shift, how everybody is identifying with everybody else, even to the point where you may not figure out who's talking or who's thinking. And uh, the uh, these voices and relationships go through time. So that we're talking about the past, and we're talking about a past migration, and also a present uh, immigration. Once I was on an airplane beside a village girl in the window seat. At takeoff, I asked her, where are you going? Wah! She shouted in surprise and grabbed a hold of my hand. You speak like me. Yes, I speak Sayup language. Are you from the village? No, my mama and papa came from Sayup villages. They left for New York. They lived in New York, then California. I was born in California. I feel like a child, younger than this girl. I'm telling about parents as if I still had them. I'm talking in my baby language. Wah, she exclaimed, loud as though yelling across fields. I am going to New York. I am meeting my husband in New York. He's waiting for me in New York. He works in a restaurant. He's rented a home. He sent for me and waits for me. She did not let go of my hand. I held hers tightly as we flew the night sky. She looked in wonder at webs of lights below. Red, red, green, green, she said. Red, red, green, green, my mother used to say, meaning, oh, how pretty. The lights were white and yellow, too, and gold, blue, copper, and above, stars and stars. Mother, mama, as you leave the village family you'll never see again, Grandfather walked her as far as he could walk, stood weeping in the road until she could not see him anymore when she turned around to look. She's off to that lonely country from where he returned broke. I felt that I was dying. Mama, girl, you are not traveling alone. I am traveling with you here, holding your hand. I know that country you're leaving for and shall guide you there. I know your future. I'm your child from the future. Your husband will certainly meet you. Baba will be at the East Broadway station. You will recognize each other, though he be dressed modern Western style. You will have a good life, a good, good life. You will have many children and live long, a long, long life. You will be lucky. You are lucky. Your husband has work. He's rented an apartment and made you a home. He saves money. He bought your plane ticket. He will be waiting for you at the airport. She listened to the wise old woman teaching her. But how to instruct anyone the way to make an American life? How to have a happy marriage? For a long time in the dark, dozing, dreaming, thinking, we sat without speaking, without letting go of warm hands. The red, red, green, green appeared again. I told her, that's Japan. We're over Japan now. We'll be landing soon in Narita. Wow, you speak Japanese, too. She admires me too much. Inside the horrible confusion of the international airport, how can a mind from the village not fall to crazy pieces? 
I found a nice American couple making the connecting flight to, to New York and asked them please to take this Chinese girl to the right gate. She thanked me. She, she said goodbye. See you again. Joy Kin. She did not look back. Good. Gotta go. Things to do. People to meet. Places to be. Thank you. I want to begin this conversation with Gish by giving her a present. Oh, a gift. And later on, if I, I, I've got this crazy story about giving her gifts, so maybe, uh, maybe we'll have time for that later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I see you have both of your arms still on, so I know that's not in here. <laughs> I'm not giving her my arm. <laughs> And it's not a garish Chinese New Year thing, <laughs> such as I gave you. Yes, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> it's beautiful. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Maxine. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so but then, and that brings me to my question for you. Okay, so, I mean, she uses this avocado as a metaphor throughout her book, but I thought of another metaphor. This avocado is a writer. This is the way writers look like. Writers are... They have these big pits. And the way she's thinking about uh, people who are independent, they have this large pit, maybe we can even call it an ego, or a big self. And, um, and all this time, we are working on how are we going to be uh, both... Uh, interdependent and independent can we can we find the skills to 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 live in this world in both ways um but being a writer is a very solitary activity uh very independent it is that you are alone and you are uh, working and actually keeping other people out of your studio space. And so, um, how can we be avocados and be writers? <laughs> I mean, how, what do you do with this, with this self that insists on being alone when you are born into this culture where you can even share your arm with everybody else. <laughs> right. If you cut off your arm, you can't write, you know. <laughs> There's always the dictaphone. It's all the software now. But, you know, I, you know, I hear you. Um, let, let me just sort of say, first of all, that actually, you know, of course, even flexi self people have always written. And actually, um, you know, Buddhists, as I don't need to tell you, are very flexi self. So the whole idea of being a Buddhist, right, is to kind of be one with the cosmos, you know, to dissolve that boundary around the self, between the self and, and the greater world. And, um, and that, that often involves being alone. So I, the question is not whether you're, you know, in terms of if we think about whether someone is flexi self or, or, or big pit self, it's not so much whether you're physically alone. It's, is it, what is your attitude toward yourself? You know, or, so are you trying to, are you trying to, are you cherishing the self at some level, trying to really understand what's in that self, or are you trying to break that boundary down? And, you know, you could be sitting perfectly quietly and, you know, and, 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 you know, in solitude, and you can look exactly the same from the outside, but actually want the, the activities are completely separate. Um, you know, I think that it, actually both of us, I think, um, you know, have, have quite an interest in, um, in social activism. And I think that's one of the ways we square the circle, right? 
And then, so for me, um, I will say that, you know, although I spend many hours um, in what would appear to be quite a big pit activity, so that, you know, I am trying to understand the self, but if you ask me, well, what am I trying, what is the purpose of my looking within that way? Um, and the answer is, you know, I, you know, I love this quote from, um, from Gertrude Stein, you know, the artist works, works by locating the world in himself. Because we wish she'd say herself, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, she did say himself. But I mean, the answer is that, you know, I'm always, I'm very tuned to what in myself is reflective of the larger world. So that looking within is never only about myself. Do you know what I mean? So, and, and that's, that's one of the many ways, I think, in which at least I, I square the circle. And I think it's very similar, actually, to the way that you square the circle. You know, because you also, you know, many hours writing this beautiful poetry, you know, you're listening to that voice within, but that voice always has to do with the world, right? So I, I, I think that these, these are kind of, you know, the kinds of ways that, that we, that we deal with this apparent contradiction. Um, I think too that, you know, when I think about kind of our, our larger purpose, like what are we doing? You know, like in one way, you know, we're expressing this truth, which, which may be quite a private truth. But, you know, in my mind, you know, ultimately we are trying to change the culture. You know, in, in the narrative I have in my mind, for better or for worse, is that, you know, culture is supposed to serve people. But culture gets a little stuck. You know, it has its, its own inertia. And, and often it is not quite responsive to the people that it ought to be responsive to. And the, the way you know that is that we look within and we feel the rub. You know, and it's our job to kind of to represent that so that everyone's going to say, ah, the culture is out of step. You know, the culture is out of step. And so, so there is a way in which, you know, at least in my mind, so this very big pit activity is related to something larger than myself. And, and I will say that, you know, I think that we both have ideas like that. And I, I have to say, many of our colleagues do not. <laughs> you probably have noticed this, you know. Many of our colleagues um, do not. Um, I, I will say, though, too, that in a general kind of way, um, you know, this, this idea that, um, that the writer should be this kind of the solitary figure, you know, whether it's just a matter of how much time we spend in, in the office um, or just kind of, you know, the way we view other writers. I mean, I think that you and I are a great example of like, we're not on, we're not on the sort of the traditional big bit model, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, as you know, that, and the traditional big bit model is that I should want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Anxiety of influence. <laughs> You know, my strong predecessor, obviously, I should want to murder you. <laughs> yes. But actually, but we totally agree if we murder yeah. anybody, it's going to be Donald Trump. Right? Yeah. Oh, so. yeah. We, we were just saying that. Oh, my. We were just I know. We're, we're getting oh a little nervous. Oh, my gosh. And we're televised and it's all going out. <laughs> you know what? Um, you Those know what, two murderesses. <laughs> you know what really surprised me? Yeah. When, okay. Well, I'm, I could be working alone mm -hmm. and, uh, and I am writing... Uh, these books, but I do feel that I am um, speaking to the world. Yeah, and uh, and then I am hearing voices of of everyone and and uh, putting all that together in a story. So, um, but I was really really surprised when my 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 first book gets published, and right away. Um, I am attacked by mm. our people. And you know, and you know why? It's because we belong to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are expected to tell their story. And we, we, and we can't say anything bad about them. And uh, we have to, um, we, we are their voice. This is how interdependent it is. Yeah, that's that's really that's really right. And of course, you know, I mean, you know, in, in my view, you know, both self constructions, you know, these are cultural adaptations. You know, and the question is, there's no right or wrong, good or bad. You know, neither is better or worse. The question is, are they adaptive or are they maladaptive? You know. But anyway, but when these, you know, but one thing about 
the flexi self is that you know the flexi self tends to have very um, malleable um, boundaries between the self and intimate others and the family, right? Um, a lot of unspoken communication, a lot of feeling that you would do anything for the for the whole, so because you don't really, it's the whole that matters, right? So your arm, really, you know, other people have arms. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Um, and Kwan Yin has a thousand of them. Yeah, but but there's a very strong boundary, you know, between in group and out group, and there is a way in which when you know when you are on that Western model of writing, the Western model is about complete, you know, um, what they call radical candor. You know, well, radical candor doesn't go with being in an in group, right? Radical candor goes with saying, you know, telling it like it is, let the chips fall where they may. And, um, and, you know, and as soon as you adopt that stance, which we must in the West, of course, the in-group is furious at you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the fury of the in-group of this feeling that, you know, you have left, that you have individuated, e even if, you know, in the larger picture, you really haven't. But any kind of move like that is greeted with, you know, a, a level of, of anger, which is surreal. And I always really admire you that you survived it, because the fact of the matter is, from the way that we were raised, we're unbelievably sensitive to that anger. You know, I mean, and that's a we are because we're so attuned people around us that, you know, it's, you know, that anger reverberates in, in such a terrible, terrible, terrible way. As I can see, I mean, it, it I can't tell you how it pains me to hear you even remembering it so many years later. I can see, you know, it's still, you still haven't forgotten. And that makes me want to kill certain people. <laughs> God, you keep talking about killing <laughs> God, it's good they're in control. But, but, but I, but I, but I mean, but I, but my point is that I, but I do think that I know, you know, when we think about, you know, the bad things about the, you know, there's so many things about the flexi self that are really quite beautiful. Um, but we, but both, both selves, you know, they has, you know, they both have upsides and they have downsides, you know. But one of the downsides is that, you know, there can be a kind of psychic imprisonment, imprisonment I hardly need to point out, especially of women. You know, so this idea that, you know, you belonged to them, that you had, what, what, who did you think you were? What right did you have? I mean, of course, all women have these problems, but if you come from, you know, if you're an Asian woman, <laughs> you really have this problem. And, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I do sort of feel like sometimes, you know, when I'm in China, there's so much that's warm and wonderful, but I could never have lived there for exactly this reason. I mean, you know, I'm so rebellious and I, you know, I, I, I would have caught so much hell, really. Um, and, and I don't think you would have done very well there either, let me just say. <laughs> But it's hard. It's hard. And so, the, you know, so, so, you know, adopting this, you know, like this Western stance, it's besides the fact that it's just hard to get the pages, you know, it's hard to find the hours. It's hard to, you know, get the words out. It's hard to make your story work. You know, all, all of these things are hard. And in addition, I think that we do have a kind of psychic burden, an additional psychic burden, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, which is often not, not apparent to others. I, um, I am influenced by the, uh, that negativity and no. uh, and those attacks, and then it's up to me to to not self censor as I go into the next book because I don't want the attacks to continue. And then and of course I'm a very open minded person, and so I think, well, are they right? Uh, mm. So so. In many, and here, here's the main re way that they have influenced me. I started thinking about the, the ethics of a writer. And do you have the right to another person's story? Yeah. Um, do, what do you do when you're talking about real people? Um, you know, you could change their name and everything, but they're still there. Uh, and, and so, um, in the latter part of my career, I, um, I made a rule for myself that I will show everything that I write about somebody, a real person, I show it to them. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we talk about it and, uh, and, and I take it if they tell me that they, that I've gotten them wrong. 
And I even tell them that uh, if they don't like it, I I will not uh, write it. And so uh, what's happened is that, um, you know, I negotiate. There have been a few people who said they didn't like it. And then I said, well, what if I did this and this and this? And actually what I do is I make it even better. <laughs> And then they love it, and, and 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 so it's 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 worked so that the writing gets even better. So this is my way of dealing with being um, a flexi self as well as an independent self. And so you have that other word, ambi, ambi-dependent. And could you talk to us about your success as an ambi-dependent <laughs> person? I mean, have you arrived at that? I don't know if I can talk about success, but I think that, you know, but your, um, let me just say, or say, you know, just what you describe in terms of your sensitivity to how, you know, to other people and how they would feel, you know, that is not typical among writers. You know, mostly I wrote it, it was my truth, too bad. You know, your feelings are hurt, forget it, you know. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just sort of saying that, that, you know, that, that is, you know, that is a, a flexy self attitude. Um, um, I just don't write about people that I know. <laughs> For just that reason, everyone says, "Oh, that must be your mother." I'm like, trust me, it's not my mother. Um, but um, I will say that in a, in a in a general kind of way, um, that I actually feel that that while it is complicated to have these two selves, um, I actually feel it's been a huge gift. And I mean, I think that you know, one of the things that that became clear to me as I did the research for, for this book and, and the book before this is that you know, is that there are perceptual differences between these two selves. So you know, with the big pit, if you have a lion in savanna, you know, the big pit tends to see the lion, right? And if you ask them, can you take that lion out of a savanna? Is it still a lion? Well, of course it's a lion, says the big pit, right? Well, the flexi self is not so sure. You know, it's a, that 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 lion really belongs in the savanna, and it it does not have that that feeling that you can just take it out of the savanna, you know, with with impunity. You know, they have this. It belongs in that savanna, and to take it out is a violation, and um and it's not really the same thing once you've taken it out because the, the context really matters. But anyway, but when when they look at the lion in the savanna, they see the savanna and its relationship to the lion, right? So in a very kind of general kind of way, you could sort of say one self um, has a kind of, you know, in, in attempt, it's the um, big pit self likes to analyze. It's, it's, it's looking at the lion, it's looking at the lion's pit, it's going in, 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 it's slicing and dicing, you know, it's analyzing. But the big pit, the flexi self is much more holistic, much more interested in pattern. Now, in my mind, of course you're better off with both. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, obviously every lens we have, no matter how powerful the lens, it only shows a, a, a partial truth. You know, of course, if you could have both lenses, that's the way to go. And I feel like that that's our, our, our great gift. You know, people will say, like, how did you make those connections? I'm like, you didn't see them? <laughs> You know, I mean, I find it very surprising. Um, and, um, and, but I can see now that it's simply that, oh, I see, you know, I looked at something this way, I looked at it with my big fit self, and then I looked at it with my flex self, self, and I saw something else. And, um, and I think in fiction, you know, of course, actually, you need both. Because, you know, on one hand, you've got to understand every character, and you've got to understand everything about them. On the other hand, you need the arc. And if you can have very complicated patterns, you know, if you want those patterns to be nice and complicated, you know, as we see like in Shakespeare, you know, those very complicated patterns. If you want to have those complicated patterns, I think you need to have a, a substantial flexi self side. So to, to me, you know, I, I, I think it's actually been a good, I'm not saying it's not, it's not without pro problems. I mean, obviously it's hugely problematic in many ways, but, you know, very, very big gift. Um, and I will say also, just in terms of, um, you know, our ability to not just produce, you know, in the world, you know, but to be human. I, I just think it's so wonderful to have these two selves. Um, I think that um, the big pit self, you know, it's like, look, if you were just a Buddhist in this world, you know, you would end up like Cambodia, you know, in Southeast Asia. You know, unfortunately, the world is such, and I just say that because, you know, you know, um, Cambodia was predominantly Buddhist. And, you know, that kind of opened the door to their being, you know, invaded by everybody, taken advantage of, you know, one problem after the next. 
finally in this world, you know, if you have to have a roof over your head and you have to, you know, a means of living, you know, and really just a means of protecting, you know, what's yours, you need a big pit self or, or you, you know, you're going to be in trouble. But when it comes to life, I think that the flexi self, just so much of the richness of life is associated with, with having this flexi self, you know? Um, so that, you know, I mean, I, and I have to say, I, I really take issue with, you know, the branding of everything which is flexi self as sort of un American, you know? In, um, in Boston, you know, we have these triple decker houses very popular kind of housing and you know that's been you know that's um, these tri tri triple deckers have been um, occupied by many ethnic families you know where you have the grandparents living with the parents living with the children but you know at the first opportunity you know the kind of the narrative is as you become more quote unquote american you should move out right and you know you should individuate and you should move to your studio apartment in new york city right you know people move to their studio apartment you know so they, they've done it that you know they they have succeeded, you know, and then they spend most of their adult life feeling really quite isolated and, you know, and dealing with that isolation. And then if they grow old, they grow old by themselves in that apartment. And uh, frankly, it's, it's kind of a terrible thing. Or let me just say that I don't know why we must brand the flexi self triple decker as un American. I don't know why we have to be either or about it and what, why we can't be both and. You know what I mean? So that the, we can have the studio apartments and we can have the triple deckers and they can both be okay, you know, so that they are both options and we do not have to feel that, you know, one is somehow, uh, like I say, you know, the old country and something that, you know, if you were, if you had your act together, you could put behind you, you know, if only one of your children was a doctor, this would not be happening. <laughs> you would be stuck in this building. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, so I really, but, but you know, in my, so in my view, I, I think to, to have both of these models is a good thing. You know, there's a, in, in my book, Tripmaster Monkey, there's a, a young man graduated from Berkeley and it's time for him to, he's, he's interviewing for a job. And, um, you know, his parents are immigrants like ours too. And, and he's getting ready to, to do this interview. And he's, he's thinking, well, why can't I bring my mother and father along? <laughs> you know, and if we're going for an interview, why can't I bring my, my, my husband and, and, and children? And, uh, uh, because, uh, oh, but these are the people I'm supporting. This is why I need the job. And, and it comes from watching uh, Cambodian refugees. I've seen them uh, go into places trying to find a job, and, and the whole family is coming along. Okay, so just to show how much I'm like that, not too long ago, my agent uh, was taking me around to New York and we're, we're meeting with publishers and I'm doing all these business meetings. And she says to me, don't bring your husband. <laughs> I mean, she had to tell me that <laughs> because I, you know, when I go on a book tour, <laughs> Hey, Earl's there. He's, I wish. I, I, I would do anything there. to have my husband come on my tour. <laughs> I would. I would do anything. You know, he's a job, damn it. <laughs> very inconvenient. Very inconvenient. But I will say that, too. I say, you know, Earl Kingston goes on Maxine's book tours. <laughs> <laughs> Shame him. But, but see, my, my agent is a real avocado, and uh, she is... Uh, re she really pushes. I mean, she's going to get you on that bestseller list, and she's going to get the right business meetings. And she had to tell me, you know, don't bring your husband. I mean, she could have said, don't bring your baby, you know. <laughs> and it, it, it is something that I do think about. Um, it's a different model. You yeah. know, it's just like, you know, I, you know, I gave, I give the Massey lectures at Harvard University a couple of years ago, you know, and, um, you know, the chair says, you know, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, the first words out of my mouth were, well, because I was, it was, you know, I was in, you know, it was, they were in Cambridge and I lived in Cambridge. So I knew they had a travel budget that they weren't going to need for me. And the first thing I said was, 
can you bring, can you bring my parents in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like in the history of the in the Massey lectures, no one has ever said, "Oh, thank you very much. Sure, I'll give them. Can I bring my parents?" <laughs> <laughs> I took a look at it. But you. I have to say, it was absolutely the first thing that yeah, occurred to yeah. me. And, I, and I, I just knew how much it would mean to them. And, and, but the fact of the matter is, in that moment, you know, these people occupy our imagination. You know what I mean? And, you know, and this is like the really, when people sort of say, okay, so how do you know if you're flexing yourself or not? You know, the question is, you know, if something is in your way, you know, if, if you, you know, first of all, most Americans, have, you know, you have two chairs in Starbucks and they're, and they're positioned in kind of an inconvenient way. Most people just move them. Now, if you told them, oh, actually somebody put them there on purpose, you know, then they wouldn't. But their first impulse is to clear them away so that they can move forward freely. And, but, you know, and this is actually an actual experiment, I will say, that was done by um, a professor at the University of Chicago Booth School um, named Thomas Talham. Wonderful. Wonderful guy, um, but if you know, but if you were to have an you know an Asian person, you know, if if those chairs were there, and that first of all they would not move them, um, but if you say, unless if, unless they thought it would help somebody to move them, and if you ask, well, why should you not move them? They would say, well, you know, somebody maybe they put them there, maybe they needed to have more people in the shop to make money, maybe you know what I mean. In other words, they they assume that that someone that there are other people that they have to think about. And, and what their purposes were, and that is their first frame of reference. Now, if you told them, oh, actually, they didn't mean that at all, then they might move them. But the question is, which is the default, right? Is the default that this the world is, is for you to move around about freely in, or is the world really something where you really must consider others first and, you know, this, that what's, what first comes to mind? And, um, you know, in, in a very basic kind of way, I think what you're saying is that you, you know, your mind is po is populated. You mm -hmm. know, it's not about your pit first. Um, it's it's populated and and it's full of concern for others. And um, and and you know, and as you can gather by my story about the Massey lectures, you know, mine is too. Um, and then what's so when you say this about your agent, I think that what's so hard for us in the publishing world is that you know we belong to a world that is among the most individualistic of worlds. Of worlds possible, even in America, and um, and almost everybody in it, you know, the editors, the you know, the agents, you know, our fellow writers, almost. I mean, I'm not going to say everybody, but I'm going to say 97 percent. Oh, that might be conservative, you know. 97 percent of them are have big pits and quite big pits. I mean, and, and are mm -hmm. very, but and you know, and and, and and are fiercely devoted to this idea. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So if, you know, if you sort of say, is that sake, you know, if we can imagine, there's a graph of how sacred do you think the pit is? You know, so this is a group that thinks that the pit is very sacred. You know, and um, and so it's just a funny position for us to be in because we, we're so often, um, you know, at loggerheads um, with with mm -hmm. the people with the people around us. You know, we're supposed to love all of our other writers, and we do love them sort of, but they, everything they say, we think you're kidding. <laughs> right? You know, you should see Gish's tour schedule, her book tour schedule. There isn't another one like it, in that. Uh, <laughs> There's all these events that she's going to, all these cities and bookstores, and most writers, uh, their, their schedule, it would show them going all by themselves to each bookstore. You know, when she filled her, her schedule, she would ask me to be with her tonight. And other bookstores, she would, she would bring a, of another writer, and she would do this in pairs. Her schedule it's so much more fun. It's full of <laughs> pairs. It's so different. Everybody else is all there, all by themselves. I well, well, it, it, it was and you a, share this. this. No, some of the, I see it as a generosity. Oh. That, you know, I get to share your book tour, your I, publicity. I, 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 I love it actually. I mean, I, I do, I do love it. But I will say that actually, people also have volunteered. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, and, and, but they're mostly Asian American. Yes. And the Ian Lee, you know, I met her in, in, in Shanghai. She was like, we must do an event together, you know, and, you know, and so, we're, you know, we're busy working ours. We both have books coming out. We're busy leaning on our publicists and our publicists are like, 
what? <laughs> no, 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 no. Really, eons. And you know, and, you know, she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And we made it. You know, actually, in the end, I, I missed the event because my mother was ill. But anyway, but but you know, but my point is that you know, this was mutual. And this last one, I was just in Seattle with Eric Liu. He wrote to me. He said, "How can I help? Can I do an event with you?" I'm like, of course I said yes, but I mean, but this is a little bit, I would say that this is where we're very different. I mean, the whole idea of most of our colleagues um, going out on their book tour and if somebody's saying, um, sure, I'll show up, you know, it, or, you know, can I help? It's just like people just don't say that, you know. Unless, unless I was so, it was so Asian, so so we were at Elliott Bay um, Books in um, in Seattle, and um, and so they had my books out and they had put Eric's books out, and he said he was horrified. He said, "Oh no 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 no! Please take my books away." You know, he didn't want them. He said, "This is Gish's evening." Uh, it was just like cut off my arm, right? Well, it, was, it was kind of like, oh, no, 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 so no, no, no. Nice. It's so nice. It's like, no, 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 no. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't sell my book because it's Gish's evening. Of course, when we had the big Asian fight, you know, mm -hmm. then we're up there. No, 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 no. Please leave those books there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yes, you take it. Leave those books there. But you know, but it was. But I have to say, you know, when I talk about the sweetness of it, you know, we could talk about the dysfunction, and there can be a lot of dysfunction, but there's another part of it that is just really sweet, and that, you know, I, I personally would not trade for the world, and so I, I love, you know what I mean, and there's Eric Liu, and here you are, and, and you know what I mean, I, you know, to me, it's, it's really very touching, and I frankly, between you and me, I know we're, I know this is a public statement, but, but, but you know, I feel like, you know, maybe the writing world could use a little more of that, you know, I mean, I have to say that it's very hard for me you know, to see that as a bad thing. I mean, I I think that um, um, I think that writing is very tough, and I think we could use a little camaraderie. Okay, I, I think that she's saying oh, questions. She's, oh, she's. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we have both of your books available tonight, but we're going to open up <laughs> oh, for questions. So please off. wait <laughs> for, no, no, no. The, for the microphone. <laughs> questions. Um, thank you. This was just wonderful. And it brings to mind a really big question for those of us who didn't have an Asian upbringing. Um, I'm sold completely, and I'm also thinking of Iranian friends of mine who seem to have this same kind of worldview and interpersonal relationships. It's very, very similar, I think. But given how deep culture is, what do we do about this for those of us who don't have that kind of cultural upbringing? I mean, given that a combination of these two worldviews um, and these two ways of being in the world um, is a good kind of combination, how can we replace this very deep cultural combination for those of us who don't have it? Yeah, I know Gloria Steinem said something wonderful that that I remember and live by, and she said that um, uh, she she will never be alone. Uh, she will uh, where she knows how to make community. Uh, everywhere she goes, she will be able to make community. Uh, it, it's like Martin Luther King saying uh, to build the beautiful community. And Gloria Steinem's, uh, well, if she, go, she, if she goes to jail, she will make a community in jail. If she is put into an old age home, she will make community there. Uh, so I, I think this is an existential, uh, making of ourselves in a community we you know there's been a um, it's even a, a fad a fashion you know i'm uh, alienated and alone and i and, and uh, i i can do anything by myself uh, i think most of us here were raised like that and then we learn this new way uh, and 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 their skills that uh, that you learn how how to br bring a sangha together, how to do a workshop, uh, how, how, uh, support groups. That's that's what people are building. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think that you're right, though, that there's another layer of it, which is a lot deeper, you know, and, and, um, and that, um, you know, because if you really talk about, you know, your actual self, I mean, that stuff, is, most of it is laid down very, very early. Um, but it is true that, you know, most of us, you know, even the very big pit self of us um, are malleable. I mean, we're much, 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 much more situational, I think, than we like to think, um, which may be a, a bad thing, um, but it's also a good thing, I think. And I think that, in in my view, if perhaps the people with who have, am, you know, ambidependent or flexi self cells, flexi cell sides, uh, were not made to be kind of um, in the shadows, you know, we're not marginalized. If we could have more of that out in the open, it, you know, if culture is, is, is infectious, you know, um, will you become like, you know, like the woman, you know, that, you know, the, the, the girl in Maxine's poem? Probably not. Um, you know, can you be shifted, you know, kind of if you're over here, can you kind of be shifted a little bit by your environment? Absolutely. And people say all the time that people come to San Francisco, it's so Asian, that they become more Asian from being here. Um, and and I, I, I think there's a lot of tr truth to that. So the answer is that I think that if you let more, um, if you let more flexi self, um, if you like more flexi selves, um, you know, kind of, um, Operate more freely, maybe, w without some of these labels and so on that that keep that kind of keep them, um, um, you know, in, in enclaves. Um, I think that probably some of it would would wrap up on would wrap up on other people. Oh God! Question, oh question God! Here. Oh God! It is actually all of this is ex a very pro -im immigration. I hardly need point out. I have one quick comment and then a question. And the comment is that there is a line in American intellectual history, beginning, let's say, with Emerson and Thoreau, uh, that, uh, and continuing on internationally with uh, people like uh, uh, Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King, both of whom were influenced by the transcendentalists, that I think emphasizes w what you're calling the flexi self. And uh, maybe in a culture that's so consumed with ideas of individualism, this countercurrent is something we ought to pay attention to, at least right now. <laughs> um, but the question is this. Um, it, it, do you think that artists, especially uh, writers and, let's say, painters who deal with uh, social subjects, do you think they are more likely in all cultures to combine what you're calling these two selves, and therefore have lines of communication cross-culturally that might not occur for people who are not artists? Oh, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. You know, speaking of Emerson and Thoreau, uh, look at them like this. I mean, they were experimenting in com community. They actually formed a commune, and uh, and with Bronson Alcott. And but at the same time, Thoreau would take off by himself, and so he was learning to be uh, deliberately independent. And, and so they're doing both experiments very consciously all at once. And uh, this brings me to the, uh, the uh, title of, of the book that I am selling tonight. <laughs> oh, I can do this. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, they're both coming out. Okay. The book is called I'd Love a Broad Margin to My Life. This, I didn't make this up. Thoreau said this. I love a broad margin to my life. Okay, so one way you could look at it is that he is, uh, um, he's going off alone, so there could be lots of space between him and other people. But I also f feel that it, means that there is spaciousness. And so there's lots of room uh, 
for everything and everyone. I also love the idea that he says, I love a broad margin, because we a margin is a border. And what was happening was, um, he, he was alone, and, uh, but he, he hears martial music coming from Concord, and he, he says, my, my neighbors are going to go to war with Mexico. They're going to attack little Mexico. And that's when he gets into um, refusing to pay his taxes. So here you see this, this solitary artist, the uh, the the socially responsible person, and his living alone was only an experiment in the context of his community. His community, uh, Emerson, Bronson Alcott, they gave him land to build that little house, so he was functioning in both worlds. You know, plus they say his mother was doing his laundry. Yes. <laughs> I mean, in truth, in truth, he was nowhere near as isolated as we uh, like to imagine him. Yes, but it's good to be with your mother. I know, I know. I, I know. But my point is that you know, we think the the, the narrative is that has come down to us is quite big, a big yeah. self narrative. But in fact, he was, you know, I mean, he was trying to stay in jail for a little longer, no doubt, to take some notes so he could write his essay, you know. But his, you know, his his relatives were were in there so quickly bailing him out that like he couldn't stay, and they're like, you know, you've been bailed out. He said, you're kidding like who bailed me out <laughs> you know? so you know there, there are a lot of you know there are a lot of wrinkles in in, in the Thoreau story and you know also he's, you know he's busy having rallies you know anti-slavery rallies and we think of them you know as living alone in the wilderness but you know in fact they're having parties right um so it's you know it, it, it is complicated but it's interesting your, your question about the arts I think that in a way that you know artists should be that way um, you know, we should be the most kind of flexi self and itself, you know, back and forth and so on. Um, but it's also true that, um, just as I was saying, be because so much of the, um, the literary infrastructure is highly bit, big pit self. So then when you ask yourself, well, you know, who are the great writers? And then lo and behold, they're all, they're all male and they're all big pit. You know, and, and this is true, you know, actually it's not just our industry, you know, and I was trying to, you know, bring up some slides for a talk I was giving and I was, I brought up, um, I just, I guess Googled, um, great movie directors, right? Great movie directors, you know, they're like, so 10 thumbnails across each screen, six screens worth, six screens worth, all men. There was not one woman among them. And this is very much tied to, to what we're talking about today, you know. So, so the answer is whatever might be the kind of the truth of what should go with what you're doing, um, actually, um, there is an infrastructure. And, you know, and this is where, you know, the dominant, the dominant culture, um, has a very big say, um, over what that, the peak is going to look like, right? And, and, the, and, and that is very much, reflective of, you know, what we all agree to be the dominant narrative, but that we are very rigorously trying to dismantle. <laughs> Question here. Hi, um, Maxine and Gish, I just wanted to thank you again. It's such an honor to have both of you here tonight. My question connected to um, that last comment uh, that you made is, as you've been talking, I've been thinking so much about how we are right now living in a time of Big pits versus flexi self, the way I see in terms of politically. And I wanted to ask you, um, given that 67% of those who voted who were um, white males voted for Trump and 53% of those who voted for Trump were white females. And these are, these are the numbers. What, what can you say in terms of um, how you hope your work can shed light? And also when we talk about, say, for example, the immigration ban, it is a non-West, it is a West versus non-Western cultures. That is um, the, the climate that's you know, under this administration that um, many people are supporting. What are you hoping, um, Gish, that your book can contribute maybe to that conversation, and a question to both of you, what do you feel is the role and responsibility or your hopes for how women of color who are writers and artists can rise and add to this moment um, uh, to, to, to advance change? Thank you. Um, well, 
Um, I, I will say that, you know, in a very general kind of way, obviously everything that we're talking about is extremely relevant to all the discussion about immigrants. And so, you know, I mean, if I had to add, you know, another layer to, you know, well, people are arguing pro-immigrant, you know, they'll say, you know, first of all, it's on principle, it's who we are, we should be open to the immigrants. Um, people will argue, and they're good for the economy, you know, it would both that it would be crippling of certain businesses to to not allow um, immigrants to stay um, and not to allow allow immigrants to enter. Um, also, that immigrants start many new businesses, so they're actually good for the economy. You know, I would, you know, add to all those arguments. Um, that they bring perceptual diversity. And that the, the, the perceptual diversity, I think, is one of our great strengths. You know, and you can and, you, and we can know this by the fact that, you know, Asia, you know, China especially, does not have the kind of um, the kind of diversity that we have, and that, that is one of their great weaknesses. So why would we, you know, shift our whole, you know, why would we want our uh, perceptual menu, if you will, you know, to to be narrowed in any way? No, no, no. You want it to be as broad as possible. So you know, I would, and, and I think that that's actually this, you know, this this idea that I have is borne out by you know the number of immigrants who get Nobel prizes and so on. You know, uh, the number of scientific breakthroughs where it is, you know, over over again, you'll see somebody, you know, something's being approached in quite a big pit way, and somebody comes in, you know, with a more flexi self, um, you know, more holistic view or pattern oriented view, and, and that changes, you know, what everyone is seeing, um, which I, by the way, I think is very well accepted. I mean, I don't know if they, they don't use these terms, but I, I think they, they see, the scientists see it themselves, and actually, um, in contrast, to the artists, actually, um, are, are very openly, you know, kind of, um, of supportive of, of, you know, other ways of thinking. Um, I mean, they, they're looking for diversity of thought. So, so, you know, so I would argue that, you know, so this is, so I would argue that, that it is, um, if you look at it through this, this, you know, flexi cell big pit lens, um, that it is what is going to make, I hate to even say it, America great. <laughs> that our greatness lies, um, in, in many ways in, in our openness, um, to to all these different ways of seeing things, and you know, and to close ourselves off is you know, I mean, I I, I can't imagine what the rationale could possibly be. <laughs> um, maybe women of color and what you. Oh, I, I'm wearing a uh, a holy medal on my a safety pin, and this is Father Toribio Romo. He is the saint of immigration, and when people cross the Sonora Desert. Uh, they will see him, and uh, and he gives them water and gives them food, and then he um, and he will direct them to <laughs> El Norte. And he even has some ideas about where you could find shelter and a job. Um, so I um, think that the um, the role of the artist is to write the stories so that we have compassion and empathy and sympathy for those immigrants. Um, this is what I'm doing in, uh, I guess, in most of my books. I am showing people, even illegally, they are illegal, like my father, illegal. Um, my and, father is illegal as well. Oh, yours is illegal too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my, my father also was an undocumented, yeah. undocumented um, immigrant. But ours, um, ours was yeah. well documented because we all had all the fake papers. <laughs> <laughs> but to tell those yeah. stories and um, and to make us uh, feel compassion for these people, you you know. Um, the uh, to, to tell the story of how hard they work, and uh, and the and the children that they are uh, uh, raising, or the money that they're sending home to a destitute village, uh, when you see uh, uh, human beings uh, uh, going through these things, then you have the compassion to figure out how to help them. Um, this is what's really lacking in um, in our government right now. Um, this is the worst thing 
when Donald Trump said that he would take the remittances away from the Mexicans, I mean, this means they are working these, these field jobs, saving their money. Didn't they send the money home? What, they're going to intercept those envelopes and take the money? I mean, he actually said that. He used the word remittances, so it sounds, you know, I don't know, legal or something. But what he's saying is take away, just take the money away. Um, I, I think it's in one of my books where, where I'm saying that there's, there's immigrants here all over the world. And they're working so hard and they're sending money back to villages all over the world. And to take the remittances away. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, he just says this. I, there, I, I, I can't think of a, 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 there couldn't be a legal way to do this. I mean, you would have to um, uh, <laughs> steal the mail or something. Yes, thanks. Thank you for the book. I <clears throat> I finished it today, and um, it just really got me thinking about about you as a writer. That you know you're putting on the sociological psychological hat, but you're still funny throughout, and that's great. And that you start with the girl, and then you get back to the girl at the end is terrific. And that's there's a different writer in there at the end. Uh, it just occurs to me that the, the, the perversity of the Western model uh, is is very strange. I mean, we were talking about art and and uh, and writing. I'm in theater. So much of Western theater is built around that singular, lonely individual. Um, but what's strange about it is that we come together to celebrate aloneness. If you think about Waiting for Godot, so much, um, and movies echo that, that communal people are sitting together feeling divided from one another. <laughs> um, and that, that, that to me is what's, what's very strange, and that, unfortunately, pretty is a male model. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, no, I so agree with you, and I, I think that, you know, one of the problems with the idea that, you know, um, you know to, to kind of be, you know, an ideal person, in this model is to always to have this big avocado pit and to define it against society. So, you know, it's always about protecting your own integrity. You know, it's always kind of a vanity, really, you know, as opposed to why not construct a society that you didn't have to stand opposed to, right? You know, why is the good guy always opposed? You know, why can't we, you know, why can't we have something which, you know what I mean, you wouldn't have to oppose in order to be a good person? Right. It seems to me it's just very. It's just very kind of self-defeating. Um, and uh, no, I, 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 I couldn't agree with you more. And of course, you know, these ideas, this, these very individualistic ideas, are built not only into the characters and the storylines, but you know, just the fact that um, you know, the, every at every turn, you know, everything depends on choice. Right. It's kind of like you know, the whole story structure is an exercise in choosing and, you know, with the consequences of your choices and choosing, you know, and, and in fact, in, in, in a well-lived life, I think, of course, we must make, do a lot of choosing and, you know, I'm not suggesting that we become like, you know, that we become like, you know, Cambodian peasants or anything like that, you know what I mean? Um, but there's a middle ground and in, 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 in any, in any well-lived life, there's going to be accepting too. And sometimes there's a liberation in that, you know. I mean, I love that you actually hit the liberation theme when you talk, you know, when you talk about in writing how liberating it is actually not to have such a big pit. Um, you know, the other day I was talking to somebody, you know, who was taking care of, you know, his his mother who's very sick, and um, he'd always had a difficult relationship with her. And you know, he's going on like, you know, I really I wanted to be a joy. I wanted to be something that I choose. You know what I mean? I wanted to be, you know, I wa I wanted to be so in some way, you know, kind of fulfilling. I wanted to reflect the circle of life. And you know, he was asking it to be a lot of things that it just couldn't be. And I, I just looked at him and I said, you know, if you were a flexi self, you would just sort of say, this is just my duty. 
and you would just do it, and that would be the end of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not asking it to, you know, to be, you know, this expressive gesture. You're just doing what humans do, and you're doing it for your mother who you never liked. The end, you know, it's kind of liberating, right? Not to have this additional burden, it's, you know, um, it's just, it, it's just life, you know. One more question, and then we'll wrap up. So I want to come back to, first of all, congratulations on both, both of you, but especially since I've read your book, yes. Um, I want to come back to the lion in the savanna. Um, the story reminds me of when I was traveling in Bali, and I was talking to a, a woman there who said, a, a Balinese woman, who said that she was having this conversation with this Western tourist who was coming through who was saying that you know he was thinking of changing his life. She's like, what do you mean changing your life? You can change your clothes. You can't change your life. And it got me thinking, as I'm also thinking of the lion in the savanna, can the lion exist outside of the savanna? I mean, you two are examples of how the lion can. You have the savanna within you, even as you're in a different environment, even as you've embraced, you're open-minded, you've embraced other ideas, other ways of thinking. And I'm just kind of playing with the idea of, you know, what is the big pit and what is the plexi self? And might it also be that the big pit is the tribal self, the self that identifies with blood and with where one is from? And the flexi self also can be about the imagined communities, the created communities, that, that you talked about, that Gloria Steinem says that she can always make, you know, that you've made. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering whether you feel there's room in your definition of the big pit and the flexi cell for it also to carry that meaning. Um, yeah, I, I, would say, but I would say it's exactly flipped, though, you know, where it is the flexi self that tends, um, it's the, it is the big pit self that goes with imagined community. You know, and the, the chosen community and, and the community that you can take and uh, with the portable community, you know, which religion is for many people, you know. Um, and so, you know, so I would argue that, you know, that is the self that can, can do those things, all of which are elective. Um, whereas the flexi self tends, tends to be a more situated self and, and a self that tends to, um, to recreate its si situatedness, um, wh wherever it goes, you know. Um, and, I would argue that in our case, that because you have that base model, um, and because we have the substitution, um, that you can actually, that actually you can, you can have a very similar structure, um, but with different people in it who are maybe not your family, and this is the modern adaptation, who are maybe not, maybe not your family, um, and, um, you know, maybe, um, there is more of an elective component to it, and yet, uh, very strikingly, I think the structures look the same, and I think that a lot of people would say that of me, you know, in <laughs> as I go about my life in Cambridge, you know, I have all these little networks, you know, and everywhere I go, you know, I, I never know anybody for two years before they have to become some some kind of group, and then you know, and then we and then we all have dinner together, and then we've been doing it for four years, and then we've been doing it for ten years, and you know, then we now we can't stop because we've been doing it for fifteen years, you know, <laughs> but I'm you know I'm, I have like a like a number of these, you know. Um, all of which have quite a flexi. I mean, you know, it's not, they're not blood relatives, so they're not they're not flexi self really, but they have quite a flexi self um, character. You know, I so I, I think you, that yeah. Um, and, and then you can sort of say, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, um, you've been spending more time in China now, mm. and so how has that uh, affected you? Well, I, I do think that it, it does bring out some of the flexi self in me, but it brings out the opposite as well. You know, and I will say that, you know, of course, you know, of course, one of the things we haven't talked about is kind of how these different cells get reified. You know, I will say reified and used um, for political purposes, right? Um, and I think the same way, you know, in the United States, I mean, so much of our big self, uh, big fit self, you know, it's been commodified, right? And so it's not really clear to me that we would have such big, pits, you know, if it weren't endlessly, endlessly, endlessly drilled into us um, by corporate America, you know, and um, I mean, I, and so, you know, so that's, you know, video games, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, the answer is, 
um, they have figured out that they can sell product this way, and um, and we ourselves reflect that sadly um and then of course i hardly need to tell you that um you know that the chinese government has figured out that oh we have this base self um we can use it we can um we can use it as an excuse to do all kinds of things um we can reify it in any number of, of ways including the gaokao for instance you know just name just one institution you know with the hukou everything right um, and so, um, you know, so it's, it's complicated. You know, I think it's complicated. And, and I think that, but what, if I had to pick, of course, you know, I did grow up here. If I had to pick between being, being manipulated by corporate America and being manipulated by the Chinese government, I'm afraid to say I would still pick corporate America. <laughs> well, because it's so inescapable. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the level of, of, um, of control is, is so huge that, you know, for me, I feel like, yes, it is difficult to free yourself from many things here, um, but nonetheless, um, you have a little more room to operate. I think we have to bring our evening to a close at this moment, but thank you for all of our ideas, inspirations, and introspection. I think we need compassion and community, so continue on. Um, please uh, join me in thanking um, Yes, Jen and Maxine Hankinson. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much. For an inspired evening and come up and meet them in person and buy a book or two. Thank you. I don't know, which is on or off. This oh, is yes. what's still on. Bye. Thank you. Hi. Very familiar to me. I may have met you somewhere. Yeah. This is the first time I've actually had the tangled in here. Hold on. Just That's okay. I got one part untangled. Let me just get this other part. Thank you. Just one more. And then we've got. Gosh, look at this. I know it's just so intricate, right? Um, so I, I actually want to ask you, like, you know, you're making a documentary now called So I'm um, going to kind of tell me there's a new way to do that. I mean, it's not being a conversation. I don't know if you're going to do a little bit of that. I would be interested to say, so I don't know if you can ask me. I didn't come up there, I didn't be busy, but I wanted to draw all the work was. And uh, I can get you a copy of my book. If you want to pick a chapter, I don't know if you it's called Weird Emotions. You may have come out of the way. That's yeah, so familiar. That's so yeah. familiar. I bet I have seen it. Yeah. My editor is Lindsay Waters. Maybe you know. Yeah, that's nice for you. She has something up in her book. She's like, uses that word weird too. Weird language. Weird as language. Yeah. There's a weird index. I've loved your books. Oh, so thank I did, you. Uh, um, so my name is um, Evelyn Chan, so I will it would just be fun to meet up because I would like to be able to give you a copy of the book and that's very nice to meet you. Good work. I'm so honored to meet you. Thank you.
You have both your arms. I know, but it's a classic. I mean, I remember when I was a little girl, and I remember that it was it was always the daughter-in-law that paid, worked so hard, and then you know she, the parents don't really appreciate her. But at the end, she gives her arms. Yes, and I remember the story, and I know such a classic, and it just gets to you, you know. Yeah, and I think.